The next item of business is portfolio questions, and today's portfolio is environment, climate change and land reform. I remind members that questions one and three will be grouped together, and question number one is Neil Finlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to improve air quality. Rosanna Cunningham. A Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy set out a series of actions to further reduce air pollution across Scotland. An independent review of the strategy is currently underway and will identify priorities for additional action. We're also working closely with local authorities to deliver low emission zones across Scotland's four biggest cities by 2020, with Scotland's first LEZ already introduced in Glasgow in December 2018. And we provide £2.5 million of funding annually for local authorities and have set objectives for particulate matter which are more than twice as stringent as those set by the EU. Neil Finlay. Vehicle emissions obviously have a major role to play in um, improving air quality. Um, at the moment, electric vehicles are very, very expensive. The cheapest one is around 21,000, and most of the smaller ones are between 25,000 uh, and over. And over. Um, currently, uh, there's great success with the Cycle to Work scheme. Does the government have any plans to um, expand subsidy to individuals who want to buy electric bikes? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I think in all honesty that is a question that might be better applied to my colleague who is the Transport Minister. I uh, hear where uh, uh, the member is coming from and I certainly would be sympathetic to the, uh, the direction the, of travel and I don't mean that uh, as a deliberate pun. Uh, I think we are all of us going to be uh, having to look at uh, um, ideas like this in the future. Um, I will uh, direct my colleague Michael Matheson to this question uh, and uh, I hope that he will be in direct contact with Mr Findlay. Question number three, Johanna Lamont. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve air quality and reduce pollution in the Glasgow area. Rosanna Cunningham. Glasgow City Council has produced an action plan containing a number of measures to improve air quality. The Scottish Government is working closely with the Council as it implements the measures contained in the plan and is providing practical and financial assistance to monitor air quality and support delivery of measures to improve air quality. Glasgow was the first city in Scotland to put in place a low emission zone following the announcement in the 2017-18 programme for government. And this will contribute to improving air quality in the city alongside the measures outlined in the action plan. Johan Lamont. Given the report from the World Health Organisation that Glasgow is one of the most polluted cities in the UK, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary agrees that working to improve the air quality in Glasgow must be a priority and a shared responsibility at all levels. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agrees that that responsibility should include transport providers, such as First Bus Glasgow, which did not put forward any successful bids for Scottish Government funding to improve pollution levels from their fleet of over 900 buses. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is not good enough? And will the Cabinet Secretary discuss with her colleague, the Transport Secretary, the urgent need to work together to discuss with First Bus Glasgow how they can play a full role in improving air quality in Glasgow? Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the latest air quality monitoring data actually confirms that air pollution levels are continuing to decline across Glasgow, uh, a trend that's also seen at most locations throughout Scotland. Uh, however, um, I am aware of the situation with bus operators in respect of Glasgow. Um, the member may be uh, reassured to know that I've uh, not just discussed this already uh, with my colleague, the Transport uh, Secretary, but also uh, with the uh, convener in Glasgow Council, because it is a matter of some uh, concern as they try to move forward uh, into the low emission zone. Um, the, it's been unfortunate. I think that some operators may have created a challenge for themselves to be able to meet the yearly target set for buses by Glasgow City Council by failing to actually bid uh, for the money that was available for that. It is an ongoing matter of discussion, however, uh, and I'll make sure that the member is kept updated. Uh, can I remind members that supplementary questions should really just be one question and not a whole series of questions. That has taken up quite a long time and stops other supplementaries. I'm going straight on to number two, Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the work of Society Zero, which is a Glasgow-based social enterprise that provides zero waste and plastic-free food uh, produce and products, and how it supports the establishment of such start-ups. Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government welcomes the continued innovative approach taken by SMEs and charities to develop a variety of zero waste initiatives across Scotland. 
We provide funding to Zero Waste Scotland, which can distribute grants to zero waste shops and other organisations through the Zero Waste Town Development Fund and the Waste Prevention Implementation Fund. Zero Waste Scotland is also running workshops for zero waste shops and advising them on the support they can receive both from them and other agencies. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Um, Scotland is right at the forefront of exciting circular economy developments, but we all need to work harder to lower our waste output. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what steps are being taken to drive behaviour change and encourage the public to choose sustainable packaging over plastic packaging and convenience? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, we are a signatory to the UK Plastics Pact, led by the charity RAP and set up in partnership with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. That's a coalition whose members cover the entire plastics value change has ambitious targets running to 2025 for plastic packaging that include working towards 100% of packing to be reusable, recyclable or compostable, 70% of plastic packaging to be effectively recycled and for there to be 30% average recycled content across all plastic packaging. Of course, we work closely with RAP through Zero Waste Scotland to support consumer messaging and behaviour change initiatives to help citizens make sustainable consumer choices. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it is responding to the latest unplanned flaring at the ExxonMobil plant at Mossmorran. Rosanna Cunningham. The recent flaring event at Mossmorran has created significant disruption for local residents and it is essential that the operators take steps to minimise the frequency and impact of flaring. The plant is subject to regulation by SEPA, which has announced a formal investigation into the latest incident. As part of a regulatory requirement imposed by SEPA, ExxonMobil has now submitted an evaluation of the best available techniques available to reduce and, where practicable, prevent the impacts associated with flaring. SEPA is now considering this and we will continue to monitor developments closely. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. With hundreds of angry residents submitting complaints on the social and health impacts being faced by the recent flaring, can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary is planning to do to address the long-term environment social impacts for the operation at Moss Modern? Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, well, I've been advised that uh, at the moment, because of the ongoing uh, investigation by SEPA, I need to be very careful about making uh, further commitments. I am very conscious, however, of the issues uh, that have arisen, and I uh, suspect uh, Mr Stewart may not be the only one who wants to raise this uh, this afternoon. Uh, I don't want to prejudice the formal investigation that's currently uh, taking place, so the immediate priority, I believe, should to pro be to progress that. I am, however, also concerned to make sure that SEPA and ExxonMobil communicate to keep the community itself updated. Uh, and I know that there is a, um, a meeting, I think I'm right in saying, uh, in the near future that has been organised in that regard. If I can have quick supplementaries and responses where possible, I'll get all the supplementaries in here. Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I note what the Cabinet Secretary has said, and I would argue uh, that a comprehensive inquiry should indeed not be ruled out and must rather remain on the table, which is what my long-suffering constituents want. And if it is the case that the already launched CEPA investigation into this recent unplanned flaring incident should take its course in the first instance, Surely that investigation must be expedited and proceed as a matter of urgency and must include an examination of the impacts on public health, as I have already called on SEPA to do. Rosanna Cunning. Well, as I've already uh, said, SEPA's ongoing investigation does need to be allowed to make progress before any further independent inquiries are considered. As with all investigations of this nature, I would encourage swift progress, of course, while recognising that this also must be done thoroughly and is likely to involve a degree of technical complexity. And in the meantime, SEPA are sharing their latest information with the Independent Air Quality Review Group, Fife Council, NHS Fife and Health Protection Scotland. As quickly as possible, please, Mark Ruskell and then Willie Rainey. There are no clear signs that the plant operators are prepared to make the level of investment needed to secure long-term environmental compliance or indeed to meet Scotland's climate targets. So would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we need to learn the lessons from Long Gannett and start planning now for the long-term closure of Moss Moran? And does she believe there's a role here potentially for the Just Transition Commission to ensure that no worker is left behind in that transition? Rosanna Cunningham. I would hope government would always uh, seek to learn long-term lessons. Um, and if the Just Transition Commission feels that there is a role to play, they are, of course, uh, able to play it. I don't want to add further to what I've already said 
uh, some of what I would respond to Mark Ruskell would be simply repeating what's already been said. Willie Reddy. I know myself, local tolerance um, of Ms Moran has plummeted. The life of the plant has already been extended. So if it breaks down this often, how much longer can it last? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I think that's a kind of technical question which I am uh, uh, going to admit I'm absolutely not qualified to answer. Uh, it is uh, something that SIPA will have, uh, I expect, uh, um, an eye to when it's uh, uh, undertaking all of its investigations. Uh, um, but there are huge issues raised by the notion of the closure of something like Moss Morin, as I'm sure the member understands, um, and, uh, uh, and they go far beyond the immediate issue that we're facing at the moment. Question number five, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that levels of wild salmon in Scotland are at their lowest levels since records began. Sorry, Rosanna Cunningham. <laughs> The decline in reported catches of wild salmon is of great concern. We are determined to safeguard the future of this important species, but we recognise that the problem uh, uh, is a result of a range of complex factors. We've identified twi uh, 12 high-level groups of pressures on salmon, and in this, the International Year of the Salmon, we will continue to work within Scotland and beyond with our key partners such as Fisheries Management Scotland, District Salmon Fishery Boards and Fishery Trusts to better understand and tackle all of these taking into account affordability and practicality. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Fisheries Management Scotland uh, have uh, called on the Scottish Government to make salmon conservation a national priority. In that context, what specific measures will the Government introduce to ensure that existing man-made pressures on our iconic salmon populations are reduced and new pressures are avoided? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, we're continually uh, assessing this and uh, taking action. We're already working across a range of projects to address the various pressures on salmon and with a number of key partners that I've already uh, listed, as well as SNH and SEPA. In March last year, uh, we committed half a million pounds to help fund research and projects to better quantify and mitigate the pressures on Scotland's salmon stocks. And in addition, SEPA is leading on work to remove or ease redundant barriers and rivers, utilising around £5 million of annual funding from the Scottish Government into the Water Environment Fund. So there's no quick fix on this, and I need to say this now. Action on any single one of the pressures we have identified is not a panacea which will resolve all of the challenges. Supplementary, Claudia Beamish. Presiding officer, um, just a, a, as a follow-on to these serious concerns about the decline of, of this iconic species, will the Cabinet Secretary consider committing to taking action to ensure that the conservation status of salmon is fully taken into account in all regulatory decisions of relevance, uh, including not just planning, but SEPA on controlled activity regulations and licensing decisions by Marine Scotland licensing operation teams and also SNH? As I've, as I've indicated, there are a, a huge range of pressures on wild salmon, not just here in Scotland, but right across the North Atlantic uh, and in other countries. So um, any one or two things that we might be able to think about here in Scotland will not address the problem overall. So we've really got to look at it um, uh, uh, in a much bigger way. And in actual fact, the, the government has been doing so over the last number of years, as we've done with the, the, the recategorization of a number of rivers, which is not always welcome, of course, by anglers. But the figures that we've seen published recently are perhaps a clearer exposition of why that has been necessary. Question number six, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to eliminate using single-use plastic packaging. Rosanna Cunningham. Yesterday I announced ambitious plans for a deposit return scheme for single-use drinks containers and that scheme is going to play an important role in our efforts to increase uh, the amount of packaging, including plastic packaging, which is recycled. So I look forward to working with partners on its implementation. There is an ongoing UK-wide consultation on packaging producer responsibility and that's another important development. That consultation includes proposals to incentivise the use of easier to recycle packaging by businesses across the UK. We also, of course, have an expert panel on environmental charging, which has an important role to play in shaping future plans, and we look forward to receiving their recommendations in the summer. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, that reply. And does she agree with me that the, the following the First Minister declaring a, a climate emergency, that supermarkets need to do more and act immediately to stop selling fruit and vegetables, 
uh, in plastic packaging, as well as using packaging that should be recycled on their own brand products. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, as I indicated, we are already uh, consulting on this UK-wide basis. I should say that all of the UK governments are uh, involved in that consultation, and that's on reform of packaging producer responsibility arrangements. Under the principle of extended producer responsibility, those businesses who place packaging on the market should be required to meet the costs associated with management of that packaging at the end of its life. The consultation commenced on 18th February and runs until 13th May. We would encourage anyone with an interest to submit a response. Supermarkets are a key part of any future solution and we are engaging directly with them on packaging reform whilst also ensuring that the food waste agenda is considered as part of the equation. Short supplementaries, please, from Mordis Gold and then Elaine Smith. Uh, data on single-use plastics in Scotland has been in short supply. For example, last year the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that it wasn't known how many plastic straws were being used when the announcement was made. What steps has been taken since then to ensure reliable data is available to inform policy? Rosanna Cunningham. I will ask the expert panel to look at that and get back to the member. That's the kind of short and snappy answers we need to <laughs> Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. We know that communities across Scotland have been working to reduce single-use plastics, but can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how many communities have applied for funds to the Action on Plastic Zero Waste Towns initiative, which she announced nearly a year ago, and how much of the £500,000 fund has been allocated to date? Rosanna Cunningham. Checking quickly through my briefing. Can't see it straight away. I undertake to get back to the member with those uh, figures. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that environmental safety standards are met in landfill sites. Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Environment Protection Agency is responsible for regulating the environmental impacts of landfill sites within the framework set by legislation. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, however, I have raised the issue of the Tobolt landfill site going into administration before with the Scottish Government. And given that both site pumps and flaring ceased at this point and the subsequent contamination both as leachate and gas emissions, I'm yet to establish which organisation is responsible for the clear-up of the contamination and making the site safe. That's despite meeting with CPAT local Could Council, you get your question, activists. please? Could the Cabinet Secretary please clear the matter up of accountability and how can she bring uh, pressure to the bear to have this site cleared? Rosanna Cuddy. Well, as I've indicated, uh, CPAT is the regulatory authority and they're actively involved uh, in, uh, in the situation at Tarbolton, which is extremely uh, unfortunate. Um, there is a complicated, uh, as I understand it, legal uh, scenario at the moment, which is not easy to resolve, uh, but SEPA is uh, um, uh, looking at that, and uh, uh, as soon uh, um, as there is uh, a way forward, then we will communicate that. Um, there is a role to play, however. Um, uh, I think that councils, local councils, should be thinking about the role that they can play too and I know that there's a bit of uncertainty around the readiness of some councils to, uh, um, to help in, in regard to this kind of issue so I hope that that uh, can also be uh, looked at. Um, there is an official receiver appointed um, and at the moment legally the environmental obligations of the site really fall to the official receiver but of course that is a, is a changing scenario. Short supplementary, please, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned their local authorities. How long have local authorities had to prepare for the implementation of the ban? And where can those local authorities that feel they may not be meeting their obligations go to access appropriate advice and support? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I think the member is probably referring to the ban on landfill, um, which is scheduled to come in uh, 2012. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> set in legislation in 2012. Um, <laughs> I sort of feel as if I'm on a time warp. <laughs> um, the, there has been significant time to repair, so it is disappointing at the moment um, that uh, um, there are not solutions in place in all councils. 14 local authorities do have long-term solutions. The others, uh, some other authorities have interim solutions in place. Um, so we are focused at the moment on working with authorities who don't have a solution in place um, so that we can try and move them forward into a place where they can comply with the ban as soon as possible. And there's extensive engagement going on in that regard. Very quickly, please, Lewis MacDonald. The Scottish Government, eight. on what grounds a local authority can refuse to provide a grant 
for the replacement or improvement of a private water supply where there is no access to mains water. Rosanna Cunningham. A local authority can refuse an application for a grant under the private water supplies grants regulations where the applicant is not an eligible person, is a public body or office holder, if the premises are a new building or if the proposed work has already begun or has finished before the application was submitted. An application can also be refused if the premises are subject to certain orders or notices under housing and building legislation or do not meet the tolerable standard. Lewis McDonald. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. I noticed there was no mention uh, of uh, requiring uh, a shared supply in circumstances where one property is still occupied and the other is not. Uh, private water supplies are often in areas of rural depopulation. Does she agree that councils should act in such a way as to stem rural depopulation in making such grant decisions? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I, I think the member is probably dealing with a very particular case that uh, uh, is in this, uh, 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 in this particular uh, circumstance. Um, local authorities do consider each case on its own merits. Um, given the costs of upgrading private water supplies, um, Ideally, you would be looking at a joint approach by householders where possible, uh, rather than the idea that each residence would have to have its own uh, um, single water supply. Um, that would become extremely expensive, um, and I think that uh, councils have got to manage that uh, when they're looking at uh, uh, grants for, for private water supplies. That concludes portfolio questions, and we will move on to the next item of business. If people could move quickly, please. Uh -huh. <laughs>